All right. All right. Well, welcome back to the Infuse Influence Show. I am your host, as always, Harry, here with my host, uh, with my co host, uh, Ulysses Youngblood. And uh, as always, we let Ulysses uh, introduce the guest. And uh, Ulysses, do your thing. Absolutely. So today we have a special, special guest. It's definitely an honor to have a leader in the cannabis space and, um, you know, basically just someone who supports uh, social equity in the space and someone who's just a, a young go-getter. I mean, we see, and it's very common around the space uh, for people to, especially in political uh, positions to be a little bit disconnected from what's really happening. And I felt like this guest that we have today has been very connected to the cannabis community and what's going on with uh, politics and regulations, not only here in Massachusetts, but across the nation. So we have uh, ex-commissioner Shalene Title with us today. Shalene, how are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm a big fan of yours, a big fan of Major Bloom. Um, and I really appreciate everything that you do to keep the community informed. And thank you for saying that about how I try to um, stay connected, because that really has been a top focus of mine. So I appreciate that. Oh, no, and it's not a try. You are you are doing it for sure. <laughs> And I think, yeah, I mean, that's the special part about, you know, what you do is, um, you know, just being connected to the community, but also just being, knowing how to, to navigate the regulations. So that, I think that's one of my top questions is that, you know, you're a cannabis attorney. Um, so how, how did you get into cannabis, right? And then like, what was your role like with the CCC? I'm sure that the, the audience would love to hear more about that. Sure. So I first started about 20 years ago as a college student, and um, it was very simple. I didn't feel I was a can of, am a cannabis user. I didn't feel that it was fair. Um, and over time, I learned what an important issue it was uh, in terms of criminal justice, in terms of the opportunity to regulate a whole new industry uh, correctly and right. And so um, I was involved in a lot of the first campaigns to legalize cannabis in other states. And what we saw from the first states was that um, we were stopping the arrests, but the industry was looking like other industries in terms of being dominated by a few uh, big white owned companies. Um, and that seemed especially unfair given the history of the drug war. So I was working on trying to uh, make sure that Massachusetts law would be different when I was tapped to apply to be one of the first commissioners in Massachusetts and help implement our legal marijuana program here. So I've done that from 2017 to 2020. Word, word, word. Um, so what has been your involvement? I know that you're an ex-commissioner. What was that like doing that, that role and how did you, you know, make it a little bit less of a disparity when it came to the bigger companies and, you know, the mom and pop shops like he, us here? Well, it was a huge opportunity, you know, to get to do something for the first time in the same way that um, Major Bloom and others have been pioneers, you know, opening some of the first stores for us as regulators. Um, you know, I just couldn't say no to that opportunity because you do something once, right? And it's like, it's going to stay that way for a hundred years, unless somebody specifically goes and changes it, you know, which is a lot more work. So in that way, it was exciting. It was also, I would say, um, quite awful and dramatic, honestly, because I was one of five commissioners. I was the only person of color. I was the only one who voted yes on legalizing cannabis. Um, and I was the youngest. And so it was a very difficult position to be in. Um, and I also found that after feeling like tokenized the first few months, I became very vocal in the media and on social media and that did get kind of um, the change and attention that I wanted, but it also made, you know, the work like pretty tense. Um, so with all of that background, I think that we did do a really good, great job making sure that racial justice is at the center of the conversation when we're talking about implementing marijuana legalization in Massachusetts and nationally, um, as it should be. And we are starting to move from the generalities to uh, the concrete specifics. 
and the feedback that we're getting from people like you so that as we work in, you know, states like New York that are just starting out and as we're working on federal legalization, that we're able to make a lot of improvements, you know, and the big ones are making sure people have access to capital, making sure people have access to property and trying to um, make the barriers more evidence-based. And when I say barriers, I mean things like the security that you need. Do you really need, you know, multiple cameras on one plant, things like that. Um, when we make them more evidence-based and not just fear-based, um, then we make the whole thing more affordable and accessible. Um, so I just had a quick follow-up. So you talked a little bit about how you, um, you know, made some noise in the media and social media. Um, I happened to watch one of the videos I think you did with uh, uh, Channel 5. It was one of the one of the more local channels around here. Um, and when it was in 2019, and at that point, they had said there was no Black-owned um, dispensaries at the time. So from that interview in 2019, or from 2019 in general, how different has the landscape looked in your opinion and how far do we have to go? So, you know, from my perspective, every black owned store that has opened is a huge victory, you know, especially knowing all of the obstacles that you've each had to overcome. Uh, so I think since then, um, for me, we've made a lot of progress, you know, just knowing how hard fought it is to have, you know, now a whole group um, but of course, not not enough. You know, nationally, four percent of marijuana stores are black owned. You know, and I, I imagine it's a, it's similar. You know, in Massachusetts. Um, but I think the good thing is we have now five years of data where we can talk about what the barriers are, but also what has been helpful, and I think that creates more of a path for the current commissioners and the current of activists to know exactly what they're advocating for. Um, I think that what we've done with delivery uh, has been a huge step forward, just allowing uh, social equity program participants um, to be the only ones with delivery for at least three years. Now we have a path forward. Perhaps we can do that with other types of licenses, or perhaps we can do that you know, in, in different states. Um, and so it's a combination of continuing to try um, new things and also making sure we improve and stick with what's working. Yeah, I just want to interject on this delivery stuff. Man, it's been difficult. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, and I, and I say this because our inspector who calling me just looking for more stuff. And I'm like, I sometimes feel like you guys don't want this to happen, like what you're looking for, especially knowing the inconsistencies and in some of the other people who are in the equity program and like what they have to go through. It's not consistent. So like, you know, and I don't think it's just exclusive to delivery, but like, you know, I'm thinking about just the consistency across the board of just licensing in general. Um, I don't want to go on a tangent, but I'm like, you know, what are ways that even though we move the needle, like how can we still improve? Like in your opinion, especially being inside the commission for you know three and a half years. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think um, one of the concerns I always had as a commissioner was that, um, I felt there was conditions that could lead to a lack of consistency. Namely, you know, if I asked a question about something that wasn't uh, in a regulation, you know, I didn't have ready access to um, a written consistent way, you know, that, that it would be enforced. Yeah. And of course that does lead to inconsistency and that leads to typically uh, inequitable enforcement, you know, and, and it just happens that things tend to be, um, inequitably enforced against people who have less resources, you know, and it's not as easy for them to uh, deal with it. So it is an equity issue to talk about inconsistency. Absolutely. So I, I'm glad you bring that up. I think in addition to participating in uh, feedback processes and regulatory processes, um, it's very helpful to form peer associations, you know, and I, I'm sure you can give examples of this where you've been through it once and you help others um, so that they know what to expect. And it's almost like you're um, yeah. addressing that inconsistency yourself. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that's every day at this point. It took us four years to get here. It shouldn't take the next four and a half, maybe even more. It shouldn't take the next equity business that long. You know what I mean? Just given the experience here. So I, lo I love that point because I say that to people all the time. We all share experiences and that's important for sure. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I happen to just, you know, I do a little bit of research on everyone. <laughs> um, you happen to be the CEO of a company. I don't want to say it wrong. Parabola Center. Parabola Center. Okay. See, I knew I was going to mess it up. I knew it was gonna mess it up. <laughs> Everybody um, says Parabola. <laughs> good try, little bro. Good try. <laughs> um, can you please explain to, uh, explain, explain to us what that is and your role in the company? Yeah, so it's a nonprofit. I started last year when I left the commission. The first thing that I wanted to do was just write down, you know, everything that I had in my head that I thought could be helpful. So I partnered with the Ohio State University Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, and I wrote a paper with them on social equity that's 10 pages. It's really concrete and practical. And um, it's meant for anybody who cares about social equity to just understand. Um, without needing all of the historical context, just like, what do you need to know right now? And, and what can we do that's helpful? Um, and so people can find that on my website, shaleentitle.com. But then I also felt that in addition to like academic papers, I wanted some room to, um, I guess, be experimental in my thinking, because I feel like up until now, states are really copying off each other. And we have so many totally arbitrary rules, like states that have home grow, you can grow six or 12 plants usually. And that's just something that, you know, someone made up 10 years ago, you know, and we've just stuck with it or we've been reactive. So the purpose of Parabola Center is it's a drug policy focused think tank. It's definitely equity and justice centered, um, but it's an opportunity to come up with new ideas. Um, for example, Congress could potentially only allow marijuana businesses to be worker owned cooperatives, for example. You know, there's so many ideas that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of uh, to make this a better industry. And um, the other thing that I want to point out about Parabola Center is that I do feel a lot of the thinking now uh, in marijuana uh, policy tends to be supported by the same um, kind of bloated interest groups, in my opinion. So you don't see a lot of independent thinking. Um, and so this is run by very small donations and uh, it's really focused on people and not corporate profit, uh, corporate, yeah, corporate profits and, and corporate benefits. Um, it's run by people of color. It's run by lawyers. Um, me and my co-founder both have um, governmental experience and a long history in drug policy. So you can find all of our work available free for the public at parabolacenter.com. Yeah. I, I, I have a question. As I was listening to you talk about this subject and then another topic before, I'm just curious, like, where did this all come from for you? <laughs> like, what, like, someone like me, like, I got in trouble for cannabis in college. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. but before that, I have three older sisters, they all love weed. So for me, it's part of like a culture and inherent on what's going on. I mean, I wasn't drastically punished for it, but it was enough for my mom to be worried. Right. But like <laughs> someone like you, like, what, what is the motivation? Like, how, where does this all come from for you to do this work? <laughs> Not too different. I think it's like a rebellious spirit, you know, and, and using cannabis and finding it unfair that people could be arrested for it. Mm. Um, and also, you know, it's really motivating when you have wins, you know, and you can celebrate those wins. And also this movement, it was very respectful of young people when I got involved, you know, so you had the opportunity to fight for something, to see really quick progress and make a change. Like that's honestly my kind of theory of change in general, no matter what it is that you're working on. Of course, you should know what you're talking about. And of course, you should understand, you know, the system that you're trying to change. But if you have fun and you celebrate your small wins, people are going to come back and keep working with you. I kind of think that's the most important thing. So that's kind of what kept me in it was just how much fun I was having. Mm, no, that's that's great. And just talk about the small wins. I love that. Without a doubt. What are some of the challenges that you ran into in all your experience, even with the CCC? The biggest challenge. Uh, <laughs> Big resistance to change, for mm -hmm. sure, um, within government, because the government just has this inertia that um, you want to do the least possible, and mm -hmm. particularly in Massachusetts. So I don't know how much you talk about um, Massachusetts-specific politics on your show, 
Um, but I feel like it's very unique to Massachusetts that we have this total lack of transparency in our state government, even though you know we're seen as really progressive. Um, our state house is, is quite dysfunctional. So that was a major challenge for us. Um, I think it was really hard to watch, you know, in 2016, we had this groundbreaking law. We were the first ones to pass a statewide equity mandate. And then, you know, over the next five years, we're watching Illinois and, you know, all these like states that are not considered to be as progressive as us, they have loan funds, they are, their governors are expunging, you know, thousands of convictions at a time. And we're still here, like stuck in 2015. That was a big, big challenge to just not see us, you know, catching up with other states. And it's really, it's really tough when the legislature and the governor are very like anti-cannabis, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's extremely important what you do and your center does in general. Um, me, myself, I'm extremely, like, I just got into industry when I started working here. Um, and I kind of, I mean, for, especially the location that we're in, we really see a lot of the different side of the city that I grew up in, um, which really kind of moved me to really do, like, more exposure clinics and we're trying to organize, I mean, trying to do my first one I ever did in my life. So I'm trying to figure that out. What is some advice you would say to someone like me or somebody else who has the passion to try to help people that's been marginalized by this um, with expungement clinics and stuff like that? I love that question. I mean, you're doing it. Um, I know I've seen people who um, come from the community do way more successful expungement clinics and the like than those that are um you know, funded really well, or, you know, have a ton of lawyers, because the most important thing is the outreach. If people don't show up and people don't have that um, trust, you know, to come to the event and that, you know, you're there to do something useful, um, then there's no point. So I think a little bit going back to my last answer, I think if you can make the event fun, you know, and make people show up who otherwise wouldn't, that is really helpful. And then you can get have a sense of like people wanting to come back and wanting to get involved in what you're working on. Um, and then also, you know, partnerships are really important. I think um, there's a lot of great companies that are always willing to sponsor those types of events. Um, we did a lot of work at the commission to additionally incentivize them by making sure that if you're a business, if you're a cannabis business in Massachusetts, you have to be doing something that has a positive impact on um, disproportionately harmed communities. So, you know, a bunch of, of businesses teaming up together um, is helpful. Uh, what do you think are the most, um, what advice would you give to someone who's doing that for the first time? Um, I would say make sure you have the right people with you, a, a team of people who are actually gonna help you get it, get it through. Um, I'm still, you know, at this point trying to find the lawyers cause I mean, I only know so many people at this point. But I mean, just make sure you have the right plan. I mean, for me, the plan for me is to also be able to help give education on the social equity program. Um, I didn't know about it until I started working here. Even when I started working here, I didn't really understand it until I was in it every single day. Um, and I feel like the information is there, but it's kind of, I don't want to say it's hidden, but it's not easily accessible to everyone. Um, so that's kind of where I want to go with it, because I mean, if you really if you really have passion for cannabis and you're good at it, you should have the same opportunities as anybody else who can easily find the information. Yeah, that's really good feedback. I think it's helpful to, um, as you said, to try and do more than one thing with each event, uh, because while people are there, if you can give them information about things, they information that they don't even know that they <laughs> need, you know, that should keep them coming back as well. I mean, so where do you think that? How, how do you think is the best way to help people find that information? Because, I mean, I um, did like an app, I did like an application here for like a you know social equity program stuff like that. Um, knowing like the cutoff dates, where can people find that, and how can we make it more accessible? So the original source of the information um, in this state is masscannabiscontrol.com. But I think um, what's really useful and my favorite thing about a lot of the community groups is that they have the ability to really translate that information. And actually, you know, government agencies, um, they're very 
limited in how they can disseminate information because it has to always be in like this perfect legalese and it always has to be, you know, sent out in a way that's fair where you can't be accused of, you know, being, you know, favoring one community over another. And so agencies, I just learned this when I was at the commission, they're really dependent and they want nonprofits to kind of like translate that information and make it more digestible um, and put it out there. So one of the, um, one of my favorites locally is Equitable Opportunities Now. That's a group that I co-founded in 2016 or so. Um, that's a good place to go. Mass Recreational Consumer Council as well. Um, Elevate New England um, is a women-run organization that does a great job disseminating information from the commission. Um, you, you guys probably have more that you'd add. Um, I mean, a lot of the ones that you said, that's the ones I look at. I, I know that the uh, CCC in general has just been able to, I mean, I looked on, I saw on LinkedIn that they're actually um, making it accessible on their website to be able to see those type of things. So that's some of the stuff that I look at myself. Yeah. And actually they are hiring, I think, a media producer or something. So if people are interested, they should look at um, the commission's website. And I hope that means that they'll be putting out information in, in different types of mediums as well. 